previously on Climbing Gold. Nobody really tried to defend the compressor out. Totally unprecedented tactics. Bam, 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 bolts every fucking where. Maestri had chopped the last hundred feet of bolts. This seemed like the work of a madman. So I knew then that not only had they not climbed Cerro Torre, but they hadn't been to the Cola Conquest. First time unequivocally that Cerro Torre had been climbed from the north in history. It was the final nail in the coffin. This is part three of The Greatest Lie. A four-part series about one of climbing's greatest controversies. Sometimes writing a wrong comes at a cost. I'm Alex Honnold. I'm Fitzka Hall. And I'm Lauren Delaney Miller. This is Climbing Gold. Chapter three, Fair Means. In the 50 years following the first attempts on Cerro Torre, climbing gear changed a lot. That's an understatement. Modern curved ice tools allowed for more technical ice climbing. Sticky rubber allowed for more advanced rock climbing. Cams, nuts, passive protection, all of it. It was night and day. But maybe no advancement was more crucial to climbing in Patagonia than the weather forecast. In the past in Patagonia, if you were climbing in the mountains, you would be prepared for anything. You would take ice climbing gear, you would take you know, full weather gear, you'd be prepared for the worst weather experiences of your life. At the beginning of the 2000s, it was still normal to go like a, on real expedition. So not to stay in town, but to go inside the valley and camp there. And there the weather is a lot worse than it is in town, so it feels totally different. Duarte Pietrin co-authored the guidebook for Patagonia, and she is an alpine climbing boss from Germany. I think the weather forecast probably made the biggest change because knowing when you can go and climb makes a huge difference. To get usable weather forecasts, you really need two things, uh, weather station data and an internet connection. Again, this is Kelly Cordes, alpinist, journalist, and author of The Tower, a chronicle of climbing and controversy on Cerro Torre. But actually, data alone means nothing. You need computer models and expertise to turn that data into forecasts. And then once you have forecasts, a forecast alone means nothing if you can't access the forecast. So therefore, you need the internet. And the internet came to El Chalten for the first time in 2003, but just barely. And by barely, I mean like barely anyone had it, and it barely worked. At first, there were these weather experts that people would hire to do pinpoint forecasts for the whole region. And only a couple of climbers had access to those. And they were pretty highly sought after because it was like they had the secret to climbing there. It didn't take long for this to catch on. Within a season or two, confidence grew in the forecasts. Uh, they were astoundingly accurate because basically nothing sits in between the storms brewing in the Pacific and the Chalten Massif where you're, where you're climbing. Weather forecasts for the Chaltan Massif allowed for climbers to be more bold and more successful. But now with good weather forecasting, you can cater your gear more specifically to the objective that you're climbing? Makes a huge difference. I mean, it saves so much energy if you don't have to, like every time blue skies appear that you start hiking in and climbing and then five hours later, <laughs> you know, the storm arrives and you have to go down. Weather is everything in Patagonia. Patagonia is known for some of the worst weather in the world. And and without a weather forecast, all you can do is go out and try your best and, and hope. And you basically just get worked all the time. And so practically overnight, the game changed. Climbing in this age of new Patagonia was properly ushered in during that 2005-2006 season. In the ascent of El Arco de los Vientos, it started it all off. That ascent, if it not only closed the book on Maestri's supposed ascents once and for all, it also opened the door for bolder, faster climbing on Cerro Torre. This next generation of climbers, they were taking advantage of good weather, coming down to Patagonia with lighter gear, faster alpine tactics, and rock climbing abilities far superior to those the range had ever seen before. Enter Josh Wharton. I think sometime in 2006, like fall 2006 is when Zach and I were talking about it. So our idea was, yeah, to go down and try to climb the South Ridge without the bolts and if successful, um, maybe take the bolts out. Josh Wharton is an American alpinist who has done 
very difficult climbs all over the world. I think one of the things that differentiates Josh Wharton from other alpinists is the fact that I think at heart he really is more of a moonboard climber slash trainer slash sport climber. I mean, he loves 8a.nu and he loves taking hard grades. And so he is an alpinist and he's a professional alpinist. But really, I think in his heart, he would prefer to just train in his basement nonstop and just get really strong. So I think he's a very high performance rock climbing alpinist, which I think allows him to to attempt alpine objectives that other alpinists uh, wouldn't be interested in. In the winter of 2006, 2007, Josh went down to El Chalten with Zach Smith, another crusher. Their eyes set on Sarah Torre. Zach Smith is an American rock climber, super undercover. He's put up hard roots all around the world. But that's the thing is even when, even in his heyday, when he was putting up hard roots all over the world, I still don't know what he did. He's just a total undercover alpinist. In the couple of decades since Maestri's attack on the southeast face of Cerro Torre, the compressor route had become like this interesting case of almost cognitive dissonance for many climbers, right? Most thought it was an abomination and that never should have been established. Nobody really tried to defend the compressor route as a, a valid approach to alpinism. And yet, by this stage, hundreds of climbers had attempted it. The compressor route provided a path to one of the most coveted summits in the world. And despite its sort of troubled reputation, people just couldn't pass it up. But a shift started happening, and more and more climbers started wondering, could it be possible to climb the southeast ridge without the bolts? Josh and Zach, they wanted to try. Well, what did, what did the phrase fair means mean to you guys? It meant to, to climb the mountain by like sort of what existed before the, the compressor route was there. So without the bolts, essentially. Fair means ascent. We didn't think that using a compressor and a drill was a fair <laughs> way of getting to the top. Territory, by fair means or not at all. That's not a new term, by the way. It goes way back. The idea of fair play in the mountains has been around for a long, long time. They wanted to climb the southeast ridge without Maestri's bolts. And if they could prove that it was possible, maybe, just maybe, they'd take out the bolts and end the conversation once and for all. So you guys were considering removing the bolts, uh, you know, as early as 2006? Uh, yeah. We reached out to people like friends in the climbing community and respected Patagonia climbers and sort of got their opinions about it. And almost across the board, everybody was supportive of the idea and thought it would be a positive thing. So we went into that trip, you know, obviously not necessarily expecting to get a weather window or expecting to get to climb territory, but hopeful that we would and thinking about removing the bolts if we had a chance. And why is that that... You know, I mean, it's, it's interesting to think that if you can climb it without the bolts, then you're entitled to remove the bolts. Like, is that is that a general philosophy that we should apply to climbing? Like, should I be going up and chopping the free rider? <laughs> um, I think that just because Saratori was such like Maestri's ascent in the compressor, it was such an anomaly and outside the norm of climbing ethics, and it affected the history of the mountain so much, is why it seemed like an appropriate thing to do. And because it was giving people so much tunnel vision in the way they were approaching the mountain. Like, I remember at the time I was rereading what I wrote about this for like a, a rock and ice article back in 2007. And the analogy I made was what if somebody had chipped realization down to be a 14B or something. And that's kind of what it felt like at the time. Like, Saratori had been like a chipped sport route. It was a mountain that had been like leveled and taken down to to whatever the you know the time frame that it was being attempted and and it need to be sort of like restored so that it would be a difficult peak that was a you know a climber's mountain again. Josh and Zach they didn't know if they'd get a big enough weather window and even if they did they weren't sure if they'd be able to pull it off. I think everyone thought that the headwall would be the crux. The headwall where Maestri had once fired up the compressor and placed bolt after bolt, up the strikingly steep face. Climbers knew that there were features that Maestri had ignored. They thought it would be climbable, but no one had any idea how hard it would be. So we went up like heavy with lots of pitons and hooks and things like that. Josh and Zach weren't intending to free the whole thing, but they did think that they could do it without the bolts. 
And in the hopes that they succeeded, they even brought a cat's paw, it's like a little mini crowbar, to see if chopping the bolts would be possible. On the first attempt, they didn't get very far. They spent a lot of time scraping ice out of the cracks. On the second day, they retreated after hitting a dead end, but word about their intentions had spread around camp, and not everyone was excited about it. Word had gotten out that they had talked about maybe removing the bolts, and some people got pissed. Uh, it seemed like mostly one person with a couple of lackeys with him. A guy had tried and failed on the compressor out multiple times, and he like took the poles out of our tent and told us that he would crevasse our gear if he got back to the mountain before we did. It was kind of scary, honestly, at the time. It sounds like he kind of had a, a bit of a meltdown at just the idea of it. Uh, he was yelling at them, you're trying to destroy my dream, even though Josh and Zach didn't remove a single bolt. Basically, it was minor drama in the big scheme of things, but certainly it was a portent of what was to come. It wasn't just climbers that were pissed that they might lose the opportunity to climb the compressor route. The thing is that when Josh Wharton, he first tried to chop the bolts, people uh, realized and knew about that, so they, they set this meeting. This is Horacio Graton. He is an Argentine alpinist who's been climbing in El Shal 10 since the 90s, and he's been living there full time since the early 2000s. It was a spur of the moment meeting at a slideshow that two Spanish climbers had given at the visitor center. And there were about 40 people there. It was an international mix. Some of the people there were climbers, some weren't. All of varying degrees of knowledge and experience about, about the place. They decided not to give permission to do that. But many people say that, okay, that was not the whole community. That was a small group. And, and they're probably right. But I think that most of the community, just in case, will say, just leave it like that. So they debate chopping the bolts, and then they put it to a vote. Of the 40 people there, 30 vote to keep the bolts. So it's a pretty random sampling of folks. This vote, the guy who organized it told me, he, he, he told me it was not intended as definitive word, but rather as a suggestion. But after the vote, people in the community started using this vote to support their argument that there was some sorts of consensus around the bolts. Like, Maestri never got anybody's permission to deface Saratore in the first place, nor has a single climber who's come and done exactly what they pleased ever since then. And that's the thing about climbing it. It's not a democracy. It never has been. It's actually part of what we like about it. After the meeting, Josh and Zach went back to Saratori. They were still committed to a fair means ascent, but they'd given up on the idea of chopping the bolts. I think I was like 27 at the time, and that was like the first time I did um, experience that kind of drama and like being physically threatened. And Zach and I were both instantly like, oh, we are not into this at all. Like, we care, care about this from an idealistic point of view, but... We're not, we don't care enough that we're willing to like get, get into a fist, yeah, get into a fist fight about it. <laughs> uh, so how did that ascent go for you guys? We had much worse weather, but we made it back to our high point And we also found this variant that took us around the second major bolt ladder through some ice chimneys and got into the head wall. And then on the head wall, it was super cold, very windy. And so basically like 150 feet into the head wall, we started clipping the bolts. And did you take it to the summit that way? We climbed to within like 30 feet of the summit and decided not to, not to climb the final mushroom because it was the winds were like nuclear cold. But it was funny because at the time, you know, people use that as sort of this thing like, well, look, those guys still didn't even make it to the top. But to both Zach and I, as soon as we started clipping the bolts, it was as if we'd failed anyway. Joss and Zach made this huge leap on Saratoria's southeast ridge, and even though they weren't successful, they'd gotten a taste of the community backlash. The prize and the consequence of a fair means ascent were still out there. I think there is, in many realms of life, an element of restraint, which is sort of like humility of leaving something to a different generation, like leaving something for somebody else to do, perhaps acknowledging your smallness in 
the scope of the endeavor. And if you can't pull it off, you, you leave it for someone else to do in better style. When you're young, you have, you're ambitious and idealistic. Certainly that was a piece of it for Zach and I. A fair means ascent of the Southeast Ridge would have to wait for a younger generation. Climbers with the strength, skills, and stoke to pull it off. We'll be back with more after the break. I had the idea, I think it was in 2008, when I was in the Cochamo Valley in Chile, together with a couple of friends. This is David Lama. This tape is from an interview David did with our producer Evan Phillips back in 2018. David died in 2019. I remember we were sitting in the refugio for a couple of days when it would rain, and there were these old climbing magazines laying around, and I would just grab a couple and, you know, go through them. And there was this photo of the head wall of Cerro Torre that I really remember striking my eye from the very first moment on. And I was like, I could see there were features on it. So David was this outrageously good Austrian climber. Uh, he started as a sport climber and did incredibly well at comps as a kid. He climbed 514B when he was just 14 years old. And both his parents were renowned climbers as well. And he was the youngest person to compete at the World Cup and the first to win bouldering and lead in the same year. Growing up as a sport climber and growing up competition climbing, for me, especially at that time, you know, free climbing was just I don't know, I don't want to say the only approach, but maybe the most natural approach to me. But then in 2011, he really shifted towards alpinism and brought that sport climbing athleticism that he had developed as a kid uh, to some huge feats in the big mountains, including the southeast ridge of Cerro Torre. And started to wonder, like, why did nobody climb those features? I mean, it looks so freaking cool up there to just imagine yourself hanging off 1,500 meter face, being really close to the top and climbing those flakes up there. David was really upping the ante, because not only did he intend to climb Cerro Torre by fair means if possible, but mostly he wanted to free climb it. And he was not discreet about his plans. So on David's uh, first attempt, he, he had sprayed a bunch beforehand. I mean, he had thought he would have no problem. He, he'd walk up it because you know, he climbed so hard. But David wasn't going to Patagonia just to climb Cerro Torre. In fact, his sponsor, Red Bull, they'd be joining him to take on a big project. And he went up there and there was a helicopter film crew and all that. And the film crew had added more bolts to what is already the most overbolted route in the world, the southeast ridge of Cerro Torre, and left maybe a couple thousand feet of fixed ropes littered there. I mean, they, they had turned it in, into even more of a mess, even more of a junk show. And David got a ton of criticism from a lot of people. Yeah, while David had been focused on the climbing, Red Bull had put together this film team, and the safety manager for that film team had placed even more bolts on the compressor route, ones that he had said were necessary to facilitate the filming. I mean, in David's defense that, you know, Red Bull had hired the film crew and, you know, that's not David's doing, but it is his production. You know, without him, they're not there. Climbing territory is hard enough, but making a whole film about it, it adds this even bigger layer of complication to the whole thing. I remember I was there in the mountain and I see newborns everywhere. And I thought, OK, this is this is not good. I mean, we're talking about taking out the bolts and we put more. As Horacio says, people are, like, really upset about this. They definitely don't want more bolts on Cerro Torre. And so Red Bull, they end up hiring some local Argentine climbers, including Horacio, to clean up the mess. They recognize the mistake. They say, OK, they are, this is not good. We're going to remove the things. And they hire us to go clean the mountain in, in many ways. So that first season, they didn't do much. And they realized they had to be more conscious about the ethics, what they want to do. Because they want to make a big movie, right? So for a big movie, they need to do some stuff that is not ethically pleasant, you know, in the climbing. And David got a lot of grief online for this. And to his credit, he learned from it, took it in stride, and he vowed publicly to do better. Amazingly enough, David, it 
I believe he was 19 at the time, you know, showed a level of maturity that people twice, three times his age don't ever show. He listened to his critics and afterward he wrote, all at once I saw an image of myself that was completely different from the person I wanted to be. I'd come to free climb and now more metal and trash have been strewn on the holy grail of alpinism. The critics have made me think, and above all, conversations with friendly alpinists have sharpened my views on these issues. He decided that he would go back and do it better, and he still wanted to free climb the southeast ridge of Saratora. The first year, Saratora, the whole Patagonia experience was just, as we say in Austria, it was like two sizes of my feet too big or shoes too big. Um, so I was really overwhelmed and There was no way I would have reclimbed Saratora that year, I think. And it wouldn't certainly have meant the same thing to me if I would have done it the first year. David's dreams on Saratora would have to wait until the next season. But he wasn't the only one thinking about making history on the Southeast Ridge. To a high-level free climber, The Southeast Ridge has everything you could want. I mean, it's amazingly clean rock, huge exposure. It's a massive route and just crazy, crazy positioning on, on one of the most iconic peaks in the world. And certainly it was a big remaining prize in the Chalten Massif. When did you first hear about Patagonia? I first heard about it when I was quite young in a climbing magazine through probably just a photo of Cerro Torre. This is Canadian alpinist Jason Kruk. I remember showing my dad and saying, look at this, this looks amazing. I was a little kid at that point. For whatever reason, I just thought that those mountains looked impossible to climb. And I think what he brought to Saratoria was just his youthful idealism, really. <laughs> I mean, the the fact that he had the the skills and the talent, you know, he... he he met the bar for entry. Like he was able to climb a route like the Southeast Ridge. And yet he was young enough and excited enough about it and sort of idealistic enough. In the 2010-2011 season, Jason went to Patagonia with climber Chris Geisler. And after a few weeks of climbing in the Torrey Valley, they were actually packing up to leave and Chris had a flight home to catch. But as they took one last look up at Cerro Torre, they realized they couldn't leave without giving it a proper shot. This is like the hold that Saratore has on our imagination. I guess the clouds broke and like a glimmer of sun kind of illuminated the Torre and it led to a change of heart. They had a quick talk. Geisler dropped his backpack, ran back to town to change his ticket, then comes running back up. By 3.30 a.m., Chris was back. They slept for a few hours, then woke up and headed up the southeast ridge. They climbed up to the headwall repeating the fair means variation that Josh Wharton and Zach Smith had established. And there, they heard this strange buzzing overhead. Those guys are up there just being the, the low-key, understated Canadian hard man who just like change their ticket, scrappy, going for it on this thing. And then they, yeah, side by side, they've got the Red Bull helicopter zooming overhead, filming You know, David and Peter's attempt, and it is kind of like a, like a clashing of worlds. After his attempt the previous year, David realized that he needed to spend more time getting to know Cerro Torre before launching onto a free attempt again. So this time, he would just climb the compressor route using Maestri's bolts, and he'd go with partner Peter Ortner. The tactics might not have been conventional in the big mountains, but they did let David scope the headwall and see that it was far more featured than he ever had imagined. That maybe to me was the most significant year because I went back with a different attitude. It was maybe the first time that I felt more like an alpinist than, than actually a sport climber. And I started to realize what it would take and what it means to, to free climb Cerro Torre. After summoning Cerro Torre, David began rappelling down Maestri's bolts. And meanwhile, Jason and Chris were nearby, climbing without them. The duo toiled well into the night before a storm came in and shut them down. And they retreated only about 200 feet from the top, agonizingly close to the top when they turned around. At the time, it was, I think, the finest effort Saratore Southeast Ridge had ever seen. The season was over. Jason, Chris, David, they all went home. The race 
would have to wait one more year. But the prize was still waiting, out there in the wind. We'll be back with more after the break. What was Hayden like as a climbing partner and, and as a friend? Um, the best. He was so young and so talented, yet also so wise and so in tune that, um, you know, I got to climb with other incredibly talented younger people, but they just didn't have their shit figured out like Hayden did. And I mean that holistically, because it's one thing to be good at climbing, but I don't really want to go on a two month long climbing trip with someone that isn't that rad. And Hayden was so rad at everything in life in a really humble way. In the fall of 2011, Jason began planning a trip with his friend Hayden Kennedy. And at first, they were thinking of doing some climbing in the Canadian Rockies. Then we were like, oh, well, we should just go to Patagonia, why not? This tape is from an interview Hayden did with Kelly Cordes in 2012, not long after returning from Argentina. Hayden died in 2017. Hayden was one of the most talented American alpinists and rock climbers of his generation. Hayden, Jason, and David, they all went back to Patagonia that season. And it's worth pointing out how young they all were. Hayden and David were just 21, and Jason was only 24. I mean, they really are the epitome of the next generation. You know, Jason, Hayden, David, they grew up learning how to climb hard. And, and just the standard ends up being higher with each generation and also the mindset with which you look at these things. And so the way they approach their objectives naturally is a little bit different. And, and that's the way it should be. I mean, each generation should stand on the shoulders of the previous generation and we, we should make progress as we go. And, and I think that is represented in those guys and how they approach the mountains and how they approach the southeast ridge of Saratori. It was David's third season trying the southeast ridge, and he was going there with one thing in mind. We'd watched the weather forecasts from back at home in Austria, and we knew that it was an exceptional season. We knew that conditions would be really great. But for Jason and Hayden, they weren't as fixated on Saratori as they were in just getting to know the whole range better. Of course, we really wanted to climb on Saratori because it's just the most amazing peak I've ever seen. But also, we just kind of wanted to just cut our teeth on all the Torres. Like, we didn't have any specific goals in mind. We just wanted to climb on the Torres in general just because they're, you know, they are the giants. They're the best. They're the kings and queens. I don't know as far as I'm concerned. We're just the pawns. So it was cool to go down there with Jason and climb on the Torres. So, yeah. Jason, were you and Hayden even really even considering climbing Saratori? We had certainly talked about a fair means ascent of the southeast ridge of Cerro Torre. I really wanted to take a step back because I hadn't climbed Torre Eger or Stanhart. Um, it made more sense for us to pick the smallest one, climb and climb them sequentially um, throughout the season. So that was our plan. And did you guys execute the plan? Did you climb the other uh, Torres? We sure did. <laughs> did, you, did you climb all of them? Yeah, we sure did. That's a good season. Yeah, it was a great season. At wow. the at the time, it was uh, cutting edge, Alex. Yeah. <laughs> Jason and Hayden, they they had an unreal season. They're just ticking off. It seemed like everything. It, they had already climbed the other two towers in the Torre chain. Uh, Sarah Stanhart and Tori Egger. And, and so if they climbed Sarah Torre, they would do something just unthinkable in the old days, which is climb all three of the Torres in a single season. The season was still young, and it seemed like everything we tried, we just succeeded on with ease. We actually did an amazing new route on the south face of Agula de la S the day before we climbed Tori Egger. And we probably did the fastest ever ascent of Torre Egger at the time. So, you know, we were just on fire. We, everything we touched uh, seemed to turn to gold. 
just to summit one of those toys was a dream come true. And I remember standing on top being like, wholly satiated, like I could have gone home with nothing else, but you know, just that. Hayden and Jason were kind of the proverbial uh, next generation climbers, like really, really skilled at all aspects of the game. You know, ice, rock, alpine, good, good on sport climbing, good on trad climbing. They, they didn't seem to be too hung up on the old ideals of, oh, I'm a this climber, I'm a that climber. They were both just really fucking good climbers. Jason and Hayden, they were on like one of the most insane rolls ever in Patagonia. And there was only one thing left to do. So, I mean, I never, with my first two years down there before, I had never really considered even climbing on territory. I didn't think I was at all skilled enough. You know, this year, I guess, when we went down there, we kind of wanted to climb on more like the north face or the west face. Um, we didn't really want to go up the southeast ridge just because we kind of wanted to have a different experience maybe. But, you know, it was really warm, uncharacteristically warm this season. So, you know, a lot of things were quite dangerous. So the southeast ridge seemed like a really good but also very safe option, I guess, you know, because you're on a ridge more or less the whole time. So we kind of resorted to that, which, you know, isn't really a bad plan B, I guess. <laughs> Still one of the most bitching lines I've ever seen. On January 15th, 2012, Jason and Hayden left their bivy in Nipponino and headed up to Cerro Torre. We had a bit of a different idea, and that was to climb the initial 400 meters of more snow and mixed terrain up to the shoulder, the call of patience, the previous day. And so it all felt pretty leisurely. It was a small first day, and we had a really nice bivy in a tent and try to rest up and um, recuperate as much as best we could on the call of patience. I don't believe um, any other of the modern fair means ascents had tried to start from the call. They, I think most people had just tried to start from the glacier in one go. As a result, you're only you know less than 900 meters of rock climbing to the summit, which can be a pretty casual day if everything goes right. So we had, you know, the whole day to just chill at the Cola Patience, which was really spectacular to be in that position. I mean, you can see all the Tories. The Fitzroy group is really, you know, really good views of the Fitzroy group. Hayden and Jason fell asleep in their tent at the Cola of Patience. The forecast looked perfect, and they were feeling fit and sight. It had been 42 years since Maestri had been in that exact same spot. But instead of firing up a compressor to blaze hundreds of bolts, Hayden and Jason were going to go a little bit lighter. We stripped down super light. We didn't really bring anything. We didn't bring a stove. We brought one 80-meter rope. We, you know, we had a pretty big rack because we didn't know what was going to be up there, if we're going to be doing a lot of aid climbing. So we had a good amount of pins and a lot of cams, which actually was good for all the short fixing we were doing down low on the route. We got up really early in the morning um, at like two or something and started climbing in the dark, which I really like climbing in the dark because you can't really see where you are. You can't see what's above. You can't see what's below you. And then once the sun comes up, you see how far you've gotten. And it's just like this kind of cool, like you're in this bubble. And then all of a sudden, you know, once the sun comes up, you're, the bubble's broken and you're in the light again. Jason and Hayden made quick work of the lower portion of the route. Hayden's skill on rock coupled perfectly with Jason's ability to finesse the ice and mixed climbing. Jason knew the route, having come so close the year before, and within a few hours, they were standing underneath the headwall. And you're looking at the headwall the entire time, too, so it's just like this big looming, you know, monster, because you're like, I don't know if this goes, like, how is it going to, like, what's it going to be like up there? But then at the same time, it's cool because you're kind of like right in the present moment. It just feels good to climb on the spire and, you know, actually climb and not just clip bolts, like use your hands and feet and uh, propel yourself instead of be propelled by steel. The climbing was hard, but actually not that hard. Pitch after pitch, Hayden was surprised by how climbable the headwall was. There are a lot of features on the headwall. There's tons of features, actually. And uh, the rock is, you know, it's definitely alpine terrain, so there are some really bad sections of rock, but then amazing, you know, patina granite up there with perfect edges. Because he was such a good climber, he was able to just do way more of a uh, free climbing hybrid aid style. and. Um, at one point, you know, he was ice climbing with his rock shoes. Um, he wasn't afraid to grab a cam, but he was also free climbing up to a really high standard up there. 
Yeah, every pitch I remember on the head wall being kind of like, it was pretty rad because we'd get to an anchor and every time I would, you know, get, you know, another 50 meters higher, I was so stoked that it, we were, we were just progressing because I didn't really know, we didn't know if we were going to get shut down five meters below the snow or 40 meters, like, you know, it, we just didn't know. The weather stayed perfect. They were surrounded by calm winds and blue skies. The forecast showed that they had plenty of time. And before long, they'd made their way through the rock and onto the snow. I don't want to underplay it, but, um, you know, with Hayden's ability and uh, my previous experience up there trying that, it all went really smooth. So, so I mean, how did it feel climbing through the headwall with Hayden? It felt like a dream. It felt like walking on the moon, honestly. Um, I couldn't imagine a more outrageous position to find yourself because we traversed way out to the arete, to the uh, lookers left, like the climbers left arete of the head wall. Like, just outrageous, man. It had taken my stream several months, spread out over two different seasons, to establish the compressor route. And now, just 13 hours after leaving their bivy at the Call of Patience, Jason and Hayden stood on the summit of Cerro Torre. It was barely even noon. I mean, it's kind of funny because when I talk about it, I remembered certain sections of the climb really well, but it's like a dream when you're talking about it. It's not like when you're dreaming, you remember these really strange details of the dream, but you don't really remember the entire dream. So I remember on the head wall placing that Red Sea 3 at this crucial zone, or I remember, you know, following some ice pitch that Jason just led and, and like looking off into the ice cap and being like, wow, this is unreal. The duo sat on the summit snowfield, just the two of them. The earth fell away from them on all sides. Thousands of feet of air separated them from the glaciers down below. It was a dream come true for both me and Jason to climb on Saratory and do it by fair means and, you know, kind of put up a new variation or a new route kind of on Saratory was even more of a dream because it's like adding history. You're, you're becoming, you're adding to such an amazing range and you're adding to this unreal mountain. When, when you get to put your footprint on something, it's, it means a lot more. And as they sat there, reveling in their elation, they began to talk about an idea that had been in the back of their minds all along. The idea that had been circulating in the climbing community for 40 years. We had been talking about bull chopping for like the whole time I had ever been down there for at least five years. I mean, it had always been part of the conversation like before Hayden and Jason even came to Patagonia. This is alpinist Kate Rutherford. Different people over the years had been hopeful and strategizing about like how to restore the glory to territory and like make it appear fair means rock climbing in. It's all about rising to the occasion of the mountain and I felt that, you know, me and Jason had done that. Maestri's bolts, they believe, have been stifling climbers from seeing Cerro Torre as it really was, a pristine mountain. But when you're on Cerro Torre, when we were at the head wall, at the 90 meter bolt traverse, when you look up, you see these line of bolts and that's all you see. But when you can look past that and you can look at the natural feature and the, and the, the weakness of the mountain, you see features, you see climbable features, you see the way, the path. I mean, that's what we do as climbers. And uh, when you see those bolts, you just see a line of steel. But, uh, and you're somehow blinded by these features that are actually very climbable. We were on the summit and um, yeah, I remember just yelling and being all stoked and we ate the remainder of our food and we actually chilled up there for quite some time and just kind of soaked it all in. So we were talking at the summit about, you know, we were talking about the climb. We were talking about, wow, that was, we did that. We just, we climbed Cerro Torre and you know, this thing goes without these bolts. It goes without the, without Maestri's bolt ladders. And, you know, it's been talked about for 40 years. It's been talked about ever since he put them in. And all of our heroes have been talking about removing these bolts. I mean, ever since I've heard about Cerro Torre, I've heard about the compressor route and I've, and, and I've read, you know, both sides of the story, but my heroes and the people that I look up to have always wrote and told that these bolts should be, they should be taken out. People had been talking about it. So, Although the idea had certainly percolated in our minds, we hadn't actually talked about it, it as something to do until we were sitting on the summit um, in perfect weather. Jason and I looked at each other and, I mean, 
you know, we were by no means are we, you know, anywhere near as good a climbers as these legends of ours, but we felt that, you know, we needed to, to follow through with what they're, you know, what we'd read and the words that they had said, you know, and restore Saratoga to a more natural state. And in my mind, at least just give it a bit more respect because I think it deserves a lot of respect as a mountain and and also as a really difficult mountain. It's not a mountain that, you know, is, you know, easily climbed. It's a, it's a mountain for, you know, well-honed climbers and that's the way it should be, I think. For sure, one of the biggest things that allowed it to happen was simply the ability of Jason and Hayden. I mean, they were on the summit by mid-afternoon. I mean, it's just unreal. And and they had done this without using Maestri's bolt ladders. And so they're on top. They have perfect weather. They have a long talk for like a half hour or so about removing the bolts. And they were the people who were there, who had the ability, the energy, the interest, the motivation, the ideology to do it. And that's exactly what they did. Yeah, it is, it's true that you're the almost no one has ever been on the summit of Saratora and, and felt like dawdling on the descent. Like nobody wants to spend extra time on the way down to to do other things like chop bolts. I mean, my one time on the summit of Saratora was in the middle of the night at the end of a 24 hour push. And then we had 12 hours of rappelling in front of us to get back to camp. There was no like, let's dawdle and take in the scene. You know, it was like, let's get down as quickly and as safely as possible. Like, let's get out of here. Because I mean, it really is often one of the most inhospitable places on earth. It's like an ice mushroom in the middle of nowhere with with howling wind. You're kind of, I mean, it's really like most people's idea of a nightmare. Yeah, I mean, I'd have to imagine that if it had been really hard to get the bolts out, like if they needed a special tool or like it took too much time, I imagine that they wouldn't really have followed through. You know, like if it had taken 20 minutes of work to get each bolt out, they would have been like, mm, we'll do two and we'll call it good. But instead they all just popped out super easily and so you know, you get that satisfaction of like, we're doing something important. But so to be there on a good weather day, early enough in the day that you feel comfortable that you can just spend your time repelling and chop some bolts as you go all casually. Like, man, it's a really unique set of circumstances that have to come together to to enable that. Jason and Hayden began repelling. They hadn't brought a crowbar or a cat's paw, but they thought they might be able to pry out the bolts with just their ice tools. Remember, these are not modern bolts, right? They're pressure pitons. And Hayden and Jason were pretty surprised by how easily they popped right out. One by one, Jason and Hayden yanked out the bolts. Down and down they went. The compressor route was being erased. But there was another team on the compressor route at the same time. They were on their way down. It was an Argentine and Brazilian climber. And the two of them had been on the compressor out for three days. And they they appeared just like totally worked. And they looked up and yelled like, hey, what are you doing? And uh, Jason yelled down, we're chopping the bolts. And I guess one of the pair yelled back, you know, I'm glad we climbed it today. Because <laughs> you know, I guess they had, yeah, I guess they would have gotten the, uh, the official last ascent of the compressor out. At the bottom of the headwall, they stopped chopping, taking out more than 100 bolts. And within a few hours of being on the summit, they were back on the glacier. Our logic was, well, the route goes and it's not too bad, so why wouldn't we remove all of the bolts or as many as we could? But that's certainly pretty naive. Mikey and I had climbed this new route on St. Exupery that was scary, and we had come down and we were in the Torrey Valley. We were in our tent and we heard them walk into camp, and so we opened the door and peeked out, and it was Jason and Hayden. Kate and partner Mikey Schaefer were the first to learn about what Hayden and Jason had done. That they not only established the route by fair means, but that they chopped the compressor route too. They walked into camp and they put their bags down in front of our vestibule and we like fed them snacks and heard the tall tale and like got to witness them just like this giant string of pitons that they had pulled like glinting in the sun and they were just these like perfect specimens of like emaciated climbers just like so aglow with hope and like awe of what they had just done and there was so much like celebration but the celebration would not last next time on climbing gold 
in hindsight, it seems incredibly dumb. I think they ended up in jail, actually, for a while. Jason and Hayden, they were persona non grata in, in El Chal 10. You know, that really uh, took the wind out of our sails. I didn't think that the headwall would go free. I found myself hanging on the headwall of Cerro Torre and climbing the features that I've seen like four years before. History doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. A big thanks to Kelly Cordes for helping us tell this story. Kelly's incredible book, The Tower, a chronicle of climbing and controversy on Cerro Torre, inspired this series. It's a great read. Find it wherever you get your books. Climbing Gold is a production of Duct Tape Then Beer. Alex Honnold is our host. Today's episode was written by Lauren Delaney Miller, creative direction and story supervision by me, Fitzko Hall, edited, mixed, and mastered by Evan Phillips, who also created the original score for this series. Additional music by Padelm, David Swenson, and Joey Kanner, courtesy of Track Club. Our theme music is by Brendan O'Connell. Skylar Perwins is our YouTube and social media editor. Our executive producers are Jonathan Retzik and Ben Endy for RxR Sports, and Lisey Hendricks and Becca Cahal for Duct Tape Them Beer. Thanks for listening. <laughs>